Hello Year 10 and welcome back to your next living room lesson. Those of you in Miss Corcoran's group, I hope you've had a lovely Easter. Uh, and those of you in the other groups who are a few lessons behind, Easter was probably a distant memory now. You've probably eaten all your chocolate. I know I have. Um, but what we are doing today is we are continuing with our climate change topic. We've had a look at the causes, we've had a look at the evidence of it, and we've had a look at um, some generic effects. And what we're going to be doing for the next few lessons is having a look at specific places or ecosystems that have been specifically affected by climate change. So what you're going to need today is your exercise book, a pen and a ruler, your phone, and the scan of the textbook, which would have been attached to this email. You will need that today, okay? So make sure you've got that open somewhere for you to refer back to, okay? But before we dive in, as per usual, we will get started with our jog your memory. So three questions to recap some of the things we've been doing recently. If you pause the video now, scan the QR code, have a go at these three questions, sensible names, please, uh, and I'll be back in a moment. Hopefully you've had a go at that. Um, so we'll get started with today's lesson. So as I said, today we're going to be having a look at specific places that have been affected by climate change. And we're actually going to be looking at a specific ecosystem and how a specific ecosystem is going to be affected by climate change. So the title in your books today is How Will Climate Change Threaten Coral Reefs? Now just briefly, I just want you to wait for... I'm going to go quiet for 20 seconds and I want you all to be shouting at your phones now some different names of places where you know there are coral reefs. So I'm sure you can all think of one big one, um, but I want you to really, really think about where do you know there are coral reefs? So I'll just go quiet for 10 seconds and you can all shout at your videos. I can hear you. Yeah, I'm sure you were all shouting Great Barrier Reef at me. I'm sure that was one lots of you said. And there's also loads of coral reefs around Asia, Thailand, um, Southeast Asia, sorry, uh, in Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, and then loads in the Caribbean as well. So we have got coral reefs all over the world. And what we're going to be thinking about today are what coral reef is, how they are affected by climate change, where we find the coral reefs, sorry, um, how they're affected, what the impacts are going to be, um, and what are the kind of secondary impacts we might get as well. So make sure you've all got this title in and we're going to start off by having a look at what a coral reef actually is. So the first thing I would like you to do is pause your videos and um, scan the QR code or click on type in the link so you get taken to a lovely David Attenborough video where he talks you through how climate change occurs. And what I'd like you to do is have a go at copying out this gap fill into your books that describes briefly what a coral reef is um, and what conditions they kind of need to form. Um, this is a very brief look at what a coral reef is because you don't need to understand the technical science of it. I just want you to have a basic understanding of what the ecosystem is because that will help you understand why this ecosystem is so threatened, okay? So pause your videos now and have a go at copying this out. Let's go through these then. So coral reefs are made up of living organisms called oh, polyps, um, protected by a limestone skeleton. These organisms feed on the algae that grows on them. The coral reefs are only found in shallow tropical waters as they need sunlight to photosynthesize. This is called a symbiotic relationship. So to sum that up for you, coral reefs are made up of a range of different living organisms. The actual coral, the limestone, um, is created by a small organism called a polyp. And these polyps feed on algae that grows on their limestone skeleton. The algae is a small plant. These are why we get some of the bright colours that grow on that skeleton, okay? And in order for that algae to grow, there needs to be fair sunlight because as a plant it needs to be able to photosynthesize. So if the coral was deep in the ocean it wouldn't be getting enough sunlight, it wouldn't be able to photosynthesize so there'd be no algae. And if there's no algae there's no polyps, there's no coral polyps because the coral polyps feed on that algae. So in order for a coral reef to form it needs to be in that shallow warm waters. Okay so just to recap that a bit further what I'd like to do is go to your scan of the textbook and I want you to have a go at these three questions. These three questions might seem quite similar to what you've just done in your gap fill but I want you to have a go at answering these again in full sentences just to recap and make sure you fully understand how they are formed. There's also another video here this is a bit of a vintage YouTube one and um, that you can just watch to have a look at a coral reef all right so pause your videos now and have a go at these four questions.
Okay, so in order to answer those questions, you basically just have to read that first paragraph on the textbook. So our first question, what type of ecosystem are they? Coral reefs are marine ecosystems. Where do they develop? They develop in places with warm tropical water. Um, how are they formed? Uh, they're formed around our coral polyps, as we just described in the last gap fill, and the coral polyps group together, they feed on the algae, um, and that then leads to the growth of these coral reefs. And the coral's relationship with algae is symbiotic. They rely on each other, okay? So hopefully you now have got the basic information about what is a coral reef and how they're formed. So what I want us to have a think about next is where are they? So on the board is a map showing you all of the great coral reefs um, in the world. Okay, so what I'd like to do first of all is describe their distribution. So remember when you're describing distribution, you want to be mentioning things like uh, the lines of latitude, the equator. Um, obviously they're marine, so they're not on land, but you can see that a lot of them are in a particular proximity to the land. So just a couple of sent brief sentences or bullet points say, describing the distribution of global coral reefs. And I want you to have a think about these two questions here as well. What natural hazard is this similar to and why? Why is that distribution similar, okay? So just pause the video, have a look at this and uh, write some notes in your books. Okay, so as we can see, our basic distribution of our coral reefs is that they are between our two lines of latitudes. They're in the tropical regions. We can also see that they are fairly close to land, so they will, they're very coastal. We don't find many in the middle of the ocean. There are some, but um, what you can't see on this map is that a lot of these are based around small islands. So over here, this is all our Pacific islands. Um, Hawaii, Samoa, Fiji, these have all got loads of reefs and over here we've also got the Azores in the middle of the uh, Atlantic. So while some of them look like they're in the middle of the ocean, they are actually attached to small islands. So we generally find that our coral reefs are near to the coasts. In terms of what they're similar to, they're obviously similar to the distribution of tropical storms. It's pretty much identical that you find them between the tropics. And the reason for this is because both of them need certain temperature of water. They need that warm water. The tropical storms need it in order um, for the air to rise and create that low pressure. And our coral reefs need it in order to be able to, uh, for the coral polyps and the algae to photosynthesize and to grow. So they're very, very linked, these two things, okay? So, what I want you to think about next is why our coral reefs are important. So you're back on page 260 of the textbook, please. And um, what I'd like you to do is, first of all, copy out this um, key term. This key term is one we will come back to loads. And I have probably already said it to you all before, but this key term is biodiversity. And biodiversity is a variety of living things in an area. So we talk about the biodiversity of a place. So certain places, like our tropical rainforest, for example, have a huge biodiversity because there are thousands and thousands of different types of animals and plants there. Whereas we might find that a sand dune system on a British coastline hasn't got a huge biodiversity because there's only a small range of plants. And then we might find that an urban area has a really small biodiversity because there aren't many plants or many animals able to live there. So biodiversity is a really important one. So please make sure you write down that and highlight it. And then I would like you to write out these four sentences that describe why coral reefs are important. And I want you to finish these sentences. So explain how coral reefs are important, okay? So let's quickly talk through these. So they benefit the tourism industry because they attract activities such as scuba diving, reef walking, which obviously will bring income into an area. They provide important fishing grounds because they're very protected. So they work as good nursery grounds for uh, new fish. So they allow uh, new species um, and breeding to occur. Um, they contain the greatest biodiversity of any marine ecosystem, which is obviously a very positive thing. Um, and they reduce wave energy by 97%. So they protect coastal communities from flooding or from major storm events, they act as a natural sea defence to protect a lot of coastal communities. So coral reefs, whilst yes, they're beautiful, yes, we all want to go and see them, they actually serve a lot of purposes in terms of why they are such an important ecosystem. So what we're going to do next is a little bit of kind of maths and stats, actually. Um, so what we've got here is a, a list of our main regions that have coral reefs. 
we've got the percentage of them that were threatened, that were at risk of being destroyed due to climate change in 2011, and the predicted percentage that will be threatened by 2030. So the next first thing I would like you to do is just write out these two sentences and finish them for me. So which region is the, has had the biggest increase in risk? So not which one has got the highest, which has had the biggest increase between our two figures, and which one has had the lowest increase, okay? So just copy out these two sentences quickly and use the data to finish them off. So our area with the biggest increase in threat to coral reefs is Australasia, and it's got a massive increase of 86%. So 86% more, no, sorry, 76%, my maths is shocking. 76% is going to be of these Australasian reefs are going to be at risk by 2030. A lot of this will be the Great Barrier Reef, which is going to be hugely affected. And then the region with the lowest increase is Southeast Asia, which has only got an increase of 5%. But that's mainly because they already had such a huge amount threatened. It doesn't mean they're any less at risk of Australasia. It just means that it's already happened there, that a lot of their coral reefs have already been destroyed. So the next thing I want us to do, still with this data, is we're going to have a look at the percentage increase. Now, this is obviously a slightly challenging uh, bit of maths here. I always have to remind myself how to do it. But this is the kind of maths you could be asked in a geography paper. I would say this is the more kind of advanced maths that you could be asked. But it's asking us to work out the percentage increase for global coral reefs. So our global ones, so in 2011, oh, let's hang on this side, um, is... 61% and in 2030 it is 92%. So in order to work out our percentage difference the first thing we have to do is find the difference between these two numbers. So our, to do that we would do 92 minus 61 which will leave us with 31. So our difference is 31%. But we then have to um, divide the increase by the original number. So we have to I'm confused. So we have to divide it by the original number. The original number is 61. So we are next going to divide 31 by 61, which I can't do in my head right now because my maths I did earlier was wrong. Which is good. Um, let's get a calculator right. Three hours later. Our coral reefs will be increasing by 51%. All right. So our answer is 51%. That was really, really poor show for me there, guys. Sorry about that. Um, can't do mental max. That was quite a difficult one, wasn't it? So overall, our percentage increase of global coral reefs is 51%. If you, obviously I just talked you through how to do that, but it might be worth you now pausing it and having a go at working out the percentage increase for some of our particular regions so you can practice this max, especially if that first time I did it, which I don't blame you, it went completely over all your heads, okay? So the last thing I want you to have to think about is looking at this data, um, what would be a good way to display this data. So if we were to put this into a graph, how would we be able to look at this data and see it quite clearly? Now, the things to remember is that our data is broken down into whole categories, it's discrete categories, so it's not change over time. So it would not be good to do a line graph on this because it's not showing change, it's showing complete discrete groups of data, okay? So other thing to remember is it's percentages, so that immediately makes me think of doing a pie chart. So a pie chart would be quite a good way of displaying this data, or a divided bar um, would be a good way. A pictogram could work, um, bar chart would work. So this is a very common question we get in geography. They might give you some data and say, what would be a good way to display it? And the key thing to take from it is, is the data discrete? Is it in numbers or is it changing over time? And that will then tell you kind of one of two style of graphs you want to go for. So because this data is discrete, it's in categories, we're going to go for something like a pie chart, okay? So uh, we've spoken a lot about quarries and I've told you that they're at risk of being destroyed. Um, now, obviously, there's a few reasons why, but we know they're very fragile. We know they rely on certain types of water, certain depths of water, okay? So coral reefs are very fragile uh, and extremely sensitive to change in temperature. So warmer air and ocean surface temperatures can have a big impact. If that temperature of the ocean or the air around it is going to change, 
that is going to have an impact on our coral reef. So here's an image here um, from American Samoa in the Pacific Ocean. And we can see how this coral reef changed within the space of a year from this, which I know doesn't look that bright and colourful, but it's, it's an alive coral reef, to a year later looking like this, completely white. And we call this coral bleaching. So what I'd like you to do next is pause your videos and watch these two videos. And then I want you to have a go in your books at describing what the process of coral bleaching is. So what is coral bleaching and how does it occur? So pause your videos now and have a go at that. Okay, so the main premise behind coral bleaching is that as temperatures increase, those algae that are living on the coral um, will leave. They will get off the coral because it's not an environment that's good for them. It might be that they die, it might be that they move somewhere else. And as we know, it is a symbiotic relationship. So when that algae leaves the coral polyps, it then means that it's exposed and it turns to this bleached white colour. So coral bleaching occurs as temperatures increase. And as those temperatures increase, it leads to the coral not being able to sustain itself any longer. So Coral bleaching is a reason why coral is going to increase and um, why coral reefs are going to die. But on the board are four more reasons, okay? So what I'd like to do is make a copy of this diagram and I'd like you to match up our four different answers to whether it goes to ocean acidification, global warming, increasing number of storms or sea level rise. You might want to look back at the textbook scan because there's a bit of information in there that might help you. Um, and this one is already done for you, okay? So, Pause your phones, copy this diagram out, and we'll go through the answers in a moment. Let's go through these. So ocean acidification obviously matches up to this one. The acidified water has a lower pH level, which means less calcium carbonate, that's your limestone, is absorbed, so the coral skeletons dissolve faster. So if there's less um, limestone on the structure of that coral, it means that as the pH levels change, there's going to be less to kind of hold on to the algae, um, and it means the skeletons will dissolve quicker and the reefs will be destroyed. Um, global warming means higher sea temperatures, which cause coral bleaching, which weakens the structure. We just spoke about that. Uh, um, an increase in the number of storms. Delicate reef structures are damaged by the heavy rain and runoff from the land. So if there's lots of rainfall falling, they're not very deep. They're going to be affected by that rainfall hitting the surface of the ocean. Uh, and that again could damage the reefs. Um, and lastly, sea level rise. So deeper water, as we know, leads to reduced amounts of sunlight and poorer water quality. So this process of climate change and global warming can have really catastrophic impacts on an ecosystem such as a coral reef because it is such a fragile ecosystem. So last thing we're going to have a think about are the threats not, obviously we've spoken about coral reefs being damaged and we've spoken about the importance of them but I want us to have a think about why it is so bad for them to be damaged. So the Maldives and the Great Barrier Reef attract thousands of divers every year who stay in the hotels, the guest houses in that area. So I want you to go answering these two questions. How will damaged coral reefs affect tourism? And I want you to refer to the positive or negative multiplier effect in that. So think back to when we did that in your leisure unit, what impact will it have? Uh, and what will be the local and global impacts of damaged coral? Think about things like food chains as well, okay? So answer these two questions in full sentences and then we are done for today. Okay, so in terms of the impact it will have on tourism, if coral reefs are destroyed, less tourists will go to the area, which will have a negative multiplier effect on the tourism industry in that area, because things like hotels, things like shops, cafes, will see less footfall as less tourists go to visit the um, coral reefs. Less footfall means they're gonna make less income, it means businesses might uh, go bankrupt, it means that people might lose jobs, and it could have an impact on the quality of life. Um, and in terms of local and global impacts of damaged coral, a local impact would be that impact on the local communities, on the people living in that area who might lose their jobs. Um, but if we talk about more environmental global impact, we might think about, as it says, food chains, because the coral reefs produce huge amounts of fish. We know from... Um, when we just spoke about it, that there are nurseries in coral reefs. So if these nurseries are lost, it means there's going to be less smaller fish in the food chain. And if the smaller fish disappear, the larger fish are going to have less to eat, which means that the larger fish are then going to start to die out. OK, and um, obviously that has an impact on the biodiversity of an area, but it also might have an impact on the fishing industry because the fishing industry rely on the larger fish. Obviously, those larger fish, if they're not around as much, there's going to be a knock on impact on those. OK. 
Right, we are finished for today. So a few things you should have in your book. What is a coral reef, that gap fill? And then the questions as well. Descriptions of the distribution of coral reefs, the sentences about the importance of them, sentences about the most and least affected areas, uh, explanations of coral bleaching, the impacts of coral reef loss, uh, and those questions on the threats, those last two questions we just did. So quite a bit in your books today, um, but hopefully that's gone some way to help you understand how climate change is gonna have an impact on these small, fragile ecosystems. Obviously our mate Greta is always talking about the impact of climate change, but this is something we don't hear about as much. Um, if you want to go and do some extra watching on this, David Attenborough has done some brilliant things um, about coral bleaching and about the impact climate change is having on coral reefs. So just go back and watch some of his most recent series. Try and find the ones about tropical regions or about oceans and you'll find really great images of, well not great, really sad images about coral bleaching. Okay, Well done year 10, good stuff and I will see you all very soon.